So, Steve, where do you think we are in this convention? Well, I, I just love Bill Clinton last night. I mean, it's um, you know he's, a, he's an amazing performer, amazing to watch. I mean, if you love politics, you know, it's like a, being a baseball fan and, and getting to see Ted Williams or you know Mickey Mantle play. But uh, you know, 25 years after he gave that keynote speech at the Democratic convention where he finished, he said, in conclusion, and the whole crowd <laughs> went crazy with applause. You know, to see him as a former president, 66 years old, you know, up there, just hitting it out of the park. Um, you know, most popular political figure in the country, very effective speech, I think, with people in the middle of the electorate, uh, which is where uh, Romney actually made up some ground during the Republican convention. And I think you'll start to see a rescission in those, in those numbers on the, you know, back of this performance. And this night follows a really strong uh, you know, first night for the Democrats. And of course, I think it's set up perfectly now you know, for the president to come in and begin to, to seal the deal. Yeah, I think the enthusiasm gap closed uh, in these first two nights. I think, I think the Democratic base is pretty enthused. And the most remarkable thing was, you know, I think Romney had a big opportunity last week and just didn't realize it. It's the worst rated acceptance speech in the history of the Gallup poll. Uh, and that's, I think, because it didn't say anything. I mean, he spent more time talking about Neil Armstrong than he did about his economic plan. Now, I honor Neil Armstrong. I think he's a great American hero. Mm -hmm. But people want to know if this guy's going to be Mr. Fix-It for the economy, what's he actually going to do? Well, you know, and, and that the, the Neil Armstrong point, the tactical element of it, of course, was to communicate to swing voters down that I-4 corridor in Florida, all the out-of-work NASA engineers right. as the space program has been shut down. But your tactical, small-bore communication you know, isn't typically part of the matrix of a, of a convention speech. And reminded of the brilliant speech that Peggy Noonan wrote for George Herbert Walker Bush in, in 1988. You know, someone who came in uh, to the convention, uh, obviously trying to succeed the great communicator, Ronald Reagan, someone who was derided as, uh, you know, someone who couldn't communicate, someone who didn't have a vision. You know, the infamous cover of him on Newsweek, the, the wimp factor. Right totally odds it obviously with his real life, the heroic service he gave to the country. And it was this brilliant speech. And he talked about in that speech, you know, I, I'm a quiet man. You know, but I, but hear I hear the, the quiet uh, voices, hear, others uh, don't. Uh, yeah. I hear the quiet voices, others don't. And he laid out a story and he never, never looked back in the race. Well, I think Romney could have said, where was Peggy Noonan when he needed her? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, there've been a couple of speeches, um, I, I wrote about this, uh, acceptance speeches for the charisma impaired. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is that George Bush gained about 17 points mm -hmm. during that convention. Uh, Al Gore in 2000 mm -hmm. gained somewhere, depending on what poll you believe, between 13 and 20 points in about 45 minutes. But they both, for example, did something, both of them did something, and you just referred to one aspect of it, that Romney conspicuously didn't do and may not be able to do. They took their weaknesses and turned them into strengths. Absolutely. Bush said he's a quiet man. Gore said, I know my own imperfections. Uh, I know that sometimes I talk too much substance and policy, and maybe I did that tonight. Well, when you put it that way to voters, that's not an imperfection. Right. That's exactly. a strength. But, and, and I think Romney could have done that. He could have said something like, maybe I'm not the flashiest guy. Right. You know, but I, I have very strong beliefs about where the country ought to go. Yeah, absolutely. And, it's a, you know, it's, it's the singularly, in my view, the most important moment of the campaign. It's the only chance uh, either of these guys has the opportunity to talk to, you know, in excess of 20 million people. Uh, the Republican numbers four years ago, Democratic numbers four years ago, were approaching 40 million people, you know, watching it. And, you know, after the convention speeches, of course, you look forward to the debates, which, you know, just stand apart in outsized importance against all the remaining hours. Yeah. as the clock ticks down to November. Yeah, well, the acceptance speech is the one time the candidate gets unmediated communication Absolutely. with the American people. It doesn't happen in the debates. doesn't happen anywhere else. Everything else is subject to the news media, to questions, to edits. So I think it'll be very interesting to see how Barack Obama uses that unmediated hour of communication tonight.